Hello, good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, and uh, I guess good afternoon if you're out West. You'd have to be pretty pretty far to the West for it still to be morning. Uh, we hope everybody's doing well. You're listening to Higher Education Transactions, Valuation, and Structure, which is part of the Higher Education Webinar Series offered by uh, Thompson Coburn. Um, let me start, as people are still joining, go ahead and get into a little bit of housekeeping. As many of you know, uh, we have some widgets here on the screen. Maybe you can see them, and by widgets, I mean little tabs down at the bottom. Um, if you have questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. And what we're going to do, this is a 90-minute webinar today, and at the end of the webinar, we'll go back to the Q&A widget and start working our way through those questions and answer as many as we can. Um, a copy of the slide deck is available in the resource widget. So if you didn't get that in advance, and I know some people, I think we tried to email it out in advance this time, uh, but if for some reason you didn't get it, you can find it right now in the resource widget and download it at your discretion. Um, you can also find answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. For the attorneys that are tuning in, um, like all of our webinars that are part of this series, or almost all of them, I should say, uh, this webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 hours of general CLE credit, and in Missouri for 1.8. I always joke, and it's true in Missouri, you just get a little bit, the, the return on investment is just a little bit better, right? Um, we also have 1.5 hours of general CLE credit in Texas that is pending. Uh, we award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. So from time to time, you will be asked to click a little pop-up screen to reflect your continued engagement. Please do that. And then finally, uh, I always say this, and I could not be any more sincere, uh, there is a survey opportunity at the end following the webinar. We always deeply appreciate when folks take the time to fill out the survey. We do read the comments, and we try to make every webinar a little better than the one before. Um, for those of you who may be new to the series, Thompson Coburn is a law firm. Uh, we're you know, a big one. We've got offices. Uh, around the country, so in Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, and Chicago, places like that. But we're headquartered here in St. Louis. Uh, I'm here in St. Lou, where a week ago it was 7 degrees, and we had two feet of snow on the ground, and today the high is 57. So it is, it is that time of year, uh, and I'm one of those folks who um, I, I enjoy winter. I've had enough. I'm ready to turn the corner into spring, and I hope wherever you are, you're getting the weather that you would like today. Um, here is our higher ed practice here at the firm. We've got a number of folks who specialize in higher education matters or work regularly with colleges and universities, and here are just a few of their uh, smiling faces. I mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Aaron Lacey, and I'm the chair of the higher ed practice. This webinar today is part of our higher ed webinar series. So we, about once every month, uh, tracking the academic calendar in the fall, in the spring, we'll offer a webinar. They are all free, they're on demand. If you miss one, you can go back and check it out. They're on our website, again, free and, and on demand. And right here, you'll see the ones we offered starting September of last year and that we're planning into April. Um, I will just highlight briefly next month, I'm going to be doing one on closed school loan discharge, which is a, a fairly niche topic, but if you're on today's webinar and you're interested in mergers and acquisitions in higher education, this is actually a webinar that I would encourage you to tune into because closed school loan discharge and exposure is always a material consideration um, when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions in higher education because you want to try to avoid, uh, you want to structure things to avoid a teach out and this is exposure, a type of exposure you're trying to avoid. Also, if you happen to be part of an institution or a system where you are thinking about closing locations, even if the whole school is going to stay open, but if even if you have just a location that closes, you can have closed school loan discharge exposure. So again, sounds like a niche topic, but I think it comes up more frequently than people realize and certainly encourage you to tune in if you have any interest. We've got three presenters today on the line. I'm just delighted, delighted, delighted uh, to have with us Dave Moore, who's the co-founder and CEO of Salute Education. I've known Dave, Dave, I don't know, 20 years maybe? I'm probably going back, what do you think, to 03 or 04? It's, it's, if it's not 20 years, it's close to it. Um, we're, we're, and, we're, uh, we're coming up on our 20-year anniversary for sure. I know. We'll have to, maybe, maybe we could go somewhere nice. Um, and Dave is a guy who not only has been in the higher education space, but has really been focused on um, mergers and acquisitions in that space. And he and I had the opportunity to do a presentation together uh, earlier this year where we talked about 
valuation. And I said, Dave, this was so good. And I think our folks who tune into our webinar series would really enjoy hearing you talk about, um, particularly with what we consider to be a fairly significant uptick in merger and acquisition activity in higher education. I think people would be real interested in understanding how the valuation conversation is working. So Dave's got lots of experience in the space. I've heard him talk through this uh, topic in these slides before, and it's, it's great. And I hope you all will enjoy uh, getting to hear from him. Uh, also, my partner, uh, Emily Murphy, who is in our corporate and securities practice, but spends, I don't know, Emily, I think you told me about half your time um, on higher education mergers and acquisitions. So it's, it has become something I know that Emily does a great deal. She and I work together um, on an, uh, an almost daily basis on various types of transactions occurring in the higher education space. Uh, and so Emily and I, Dave's going to talk about valuation on the front end, and Emily and I are going to spend some time talking about uh, structure and how these transactions, there's so many different variations, and we're going to try to give you some good information on, uh, at least the starter information on how some of these that we're working on are being being put together and structured. Um, I'll also say here at the outset, I know Dave has a very, uh, it's like its like when folks are on, uh, you know, I was going to say Leno, he's not there anymore. When folks are on late night and they say they got to run after the interview, Dave has to run after the interview. At the, uh, after his section, he's got a, another appointment. So he won't be around for questions, but we'll do our best. If you've got a valuation question at the end of the webinar, Emily and I will uh, try to field it. And if we can't, we'll circle up with Dave. Um, and then finally, I mentioned I'm the chair of the higher education practice here at Thompson Coburn and have been uh, working with institutions of all types, uh, again, for a couple of decades, including a lot of uh, time spent in the merger and acquisition space. Um, so here's the syllabus for today. That's our cute higher ed way of saying the outline for the presentation. Um, we're going to let Dave lead off, of course, because he's got limited time here to talk about investment and valuation in the space. Um, and then Emily's going to discuss a little bit of, you know, just quickly some of the conditions we believe are important uh, uh, to be successful in M&A in higher education. And then we're really going to start getting into structure, and, and we're going to focus on um, third-party sales, meaning situations where an institution is uh, merging with or selling assets to another independent institution of higher education. Uh, and then we're going to really spend some time getting into structural models and, and talk about some things that we think are interesting and we hope you will find interesting as well. So with all of that having been said, uh, Mr. Moore, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, thanks, everybody, who's, uh, who's joining us for this, uh, this presentation today. And uh, if you haven't tuned in to some of the other uh, past uh, performances that Aaron's put on, uh, I highly, uh, highly recommend them. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're very informative. Um, and the, uh, the resource packet of, of being able to refer back to the, uh, to the materials. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Emily and, uh, and Aaron are, are, are just great resources in general. If you're not currently working with the firm, you, uh, you should certainly consider throwing some business their way. Dave, um, Dave, the check is in the mail. I want to know about like. this, uh, this, this, this opportunity to go someplace nice for our anniversary. You've never taken me anywhere. Now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's fair enough. Fair enough. All right. I'm cheap. Let's, uh, let's go ahead. We're going to move through. Uh, <laughs> I think I've, I've got control here. There. Did that move on everybody else's screen? It did. All right. Excellent. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time um, for for the benefit of uh, folks on the on the phone. Um, I've been in uh, in the higher education space for uh, a little over uh, 23 years, um, and I've been in a variety of uh, of seats kind of around the table uh, from a transaction standpoint. I have been the senior lender, um, both as a participant in uh, in financing. Uh, for, for higher education. I've been a lead lender uh, putting together large syndicated financial uh, packages for higher education uh, companies. We've put uh, loans together to help bridge uh, initial public offerings uh, in, in one case for a, uh, for a publicly traded group that was private one day and public the next. Um, I have uh, been on the operating side uh, as the corporate development 
uh, officer who has you know been out looking for and negotiating for uh, for deals to uh, to bring in, um, and then uh, on the on the side of uh, being the the chief financial officer responsible for reporting the uh, the results of of acquisitions and, and divestitures to shareholders, uh, and then I've been in the uh, in the seat of uh, of the actual investor uh, themselves uh, and sitting on boards and, and being accountable to. Uh, to ultimately the people that are writing the checks and putting money to work in, uh, in higher education. And what's interesting about the, the place that we're in right now is uh, despite the fact that uh, we have a dem-dem-dem uh, dynamic where both houses of, uh, of Congress are Democratic uh, controlled and obviously uh, Biden-Harris uh, you know, in, uh, in the executive branch, um, that should scare a lot of people away. And um, in a normal economic cycle uh, with the threat of, of higher regulation, I think that that would be, that would be warranted. Um, and it's certainly keeping some new entrants, uh, I think, from, uh, from jumping in. Um, however, what we're really seeing, and, and Aaron alluded to this uh, early, uh, is that we are seeing an increase in, in activity, both from the standpoint of a buyer and a seller. Um, and what's driving that, number one, we're obviously in a, uh, in, in a pretty different economic uh, situation, uh, higher unemployment than we were a year ago. Um, that tends to typically benefit uh, trade schools and vocational education, which we certainly fall into the category of in this, in this space. Um, but on top of it, because of COVID, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful, I think, like everybody on the phone, that we're moving out of uh, that danger zone and with the availability of the vaccine and the ability to, uh, to sort of get millions of people uh, immunized every, uh, every month going forward, um, that life is going to sort of return back to something that looks like normal. But what we're seeing is we're seeing um, a surge in applications to medical schools, to nursing schools, and just about every health profession that, that exists out there. Um, I think respiratory therapists felt like they were uh, this obscure little uh, allied health uh, profession on the fringes, and, and boom, you know, beginning last March, uh, you know, they're front and center in, uh, in, in the care team that's, that's helping to take care of all of our, you know, millions of people that have been impacted by, by COVID-19. Um, and the impact of those applications is, is a little bit like what we saw after 9-11 where there was a surge in interest in going into first responders uh, as professions. And so if you're running a school that has, uh, you know, nursing um, or really any healthcare care program, um, I, would, uh, I would be surprised if you didn't have uh, at least equal uh, lead generation to where you were a year ago and, and probably an uptick in, uh, in, in interest in, in inquiries. And that's bringing new investment into the education space. There are uh, hundreds of private equity firms and investors out there that are uh, institutional, that are putting money to work in the healthcare field um, and healthcare services. Um, and the opportunity to hear this story of we can't find good professionals, we can't find um, you know, people that are qualified to serve in our, in our environments, um, it, it, it's, it's repeating itself over and over again, and that's driving interest from traditional healthcare investors into healthcare education uh, investment. On top of it, um, I think most of us are expecting, from a policy point of view, that the Biden Harris administration is going to push, after COVID relief, um, some infrastructure spending. And that should drive more uh, enrollment and interest in construction trades and a lot of the traditional vocational education um, that frankly from a policy standpoint has been stripped out of our, uh, our public high schools for decades now um, and set up um, you know, a lot of the schools that are, uh, that are probably uh, people that are listening in on, on this call. So um, good amount of activity, good interest, and, uh, and an uptick I think in, uh, in, in both buyers and sellers. Uh, value drivers, and that's the slide that we're on right now. Um, on a lot of levels, this can apply to just about any industry, um, but it's particularly true in, uh, in, in higher ed. Um, if you are a buyer or a seller, uh, you know, clean financials are, are super important. Um, it's a quick tangent, but I think it's worth mentioning. You know, a lot of 
senior lenders. Uh, a lot of banks have had some level of bad experience over the last uh, 10 years in, uh, in lending into higher education. And um, one of the things that, that can spook a lender faster than, than anything else um, is a bunch of noise that's in the financial statements or a lot of extra addbacks that are hard to justify. Um, so the cleaner the financials and the stronger your, uh, you know, your audit opinions are uh, and simpler financials, the better. Um, excellent regulatory uh, goes without saying. Um, you know, if you've never had a, uh, you know, a spot on your uh, compliance audit for Title IV, um, good for you. Um, most people have got, you know, a little bit of something, um, but it's the it's the experience and the reputation that that institution, that management team, and that ownership has with uh, the Department of Education and the state licensure and the accrediting agencies. Um, I don't think anybody's expecting completely spotless records. There's always a student complaint. There's always, um, you know, something that's uh, that's going on because of the level of oversight that we subject ourselves to. Um, but the but the cleaner the regulatory history, um, obviously, it's going to be uh, it's going to be much cleaner. Uh, scale, and I've had a lot of questions about you know what is what does scale mean? You know, is is 30 campuses scale? Uh, is 100 million dollars of of revenue scale? Um, and this is really going to kind of fit into um, who is the likely buyer? Um, you know, a large multi-billion dollar uh, you know, PE firm is going to think about scale as something, you know, greater than $200 million generally in revenue. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you're running a, uh, you know, a single outfit that's doing, you know, 30 or $40 million uh, that, that you don't have uh, value. Um, it's just a, uh, it, it's just something that typically follows in most industries where the bigger you are, um, the perceived less likelihood that you are going to fail, and therefore you're a more stable, uh, safer investment. So scale typically uh, tips back to safety for, um, for financial people. Uh, historical success, this is really fun. Um, you know, think about what audits and financials looked like in calendar year 2019 um, and what happened in 2020 and now, you know, what we're coming out of in, in 2021. And so historical success um, can have a lot of different definitions. Uh, it can be sort of gradual growth, right? If you've had three or four consecutive years of flat to growing enrollments, um, that says a lot about your institution, particularly pre-COVID, um, where we were in a period of full employment. And um, I would say much more competitive to sort of convince a, uh, a job switcher or a career changer to come back to school and invest in their education. Um, with COVID, um, you know, the historical success is what happened, right? How did your management team pivot? Were you 100% online before COVID? Were you 100% on ground? How did you mitigate uh, your externships? Were you able to get your students through that pipeline and, and graduate on time or with, you know, as little uh, disruption as possible? Um, historical success doesn't just need to be, uh, you know, financial success, but, you know, how, um, how you've been able to navigate the headwinds or tailwinds depending on where you're, uh, where you're at in the economic cycle and the shocks that have happened. The good news is these shocks have happened to everybody, right, where COVID impacted everybody. The economic cycle generally, um, you know, can be stronger or weaker depending on the region that you're in. But it's the you know how you, how you've navigated those waters uh, in in that context, and then that goes into the next one: proven management team. Um, most financial buyers uh, don't have an ops team; <laughs> uh, they don't know a single thing about uh, how to run a uh, a Title IV business, and so the opportunity to step in and partner with a management team um, that. Is, has been running it and interfacing with the students. Um, you know, how long has your career services team been in place and what's been their experience, um, you know, helping the students so that you've got good, strong measurables on your outcomes? Um, how strong is the overall leadership of the institution, your academic side, um, you know, relationships with, uh, with nursing boards if it's, uh, if, it's, if it's in a healthcare field? Um, really, really important. And there's an opportunity right now for 
every school that's that's on the phone that's sort of thinking about either buying or selling something down the road, COVID is the ultimate um, test to sort of say, you know, what did we do right? What did we get wrong? How did we learn from it? And how did it help us position for the future? If you were a school that had no online learning at all before COVID, um, you probably had to uh, had to hustle really fast to pivot your uh, your model overnight. Tell that story. Um, were you able to then uh, also transfer the temporary powers for distance education, and were you able to convince your state and your accrediting agency to make that per permanent? Right? Is hybrid learning now part of your um, your DNA of your organization because you had to go through and, and, and basically drink out of a fire hose overnight. Um, those are those are things that I think are, are really good and a, a current topical example for you to be able to uh, to, to talk about and, and emphasize. Um, unique, uh, you know, I think this is uh, this is one that um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, most investors are are looking for something that other people don't have and it's difficult to replicate. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be so unique that you know your uh, your typical student audience is down to you know six people in a uh, in, in a region. Um, so scale sort of fits in here with uh, with with being unique. Um, I'll I'll use one example from my uh, from my own background. Uh, in in a prior life, there was a uh, there was a school that that we had acquired uh, when we were with Forefront Education, which was private equity backed for a period of time, and we bought this small family-owned architecture school in San Diego. And you know, looking back on it 15 years later, that was a pretty unique asset um, and one that could have uh, could have been done differently um, if we had really emphasized its uniqueness, um, branching it. Uh, looking for opportunities to potentially expand it internationally, um, you know, are all things that, uh, that that I think we could have done uh, better, faster, and stronger at the time looking back on it. Um, if you have an asset like that, and it doesn't have to be an architecture college, it can be, you know, it can be something else, obviously. Um, but if it's uh, something that's hard to replicate in the market, um, and you already have it, um, you should you know, you should be trying to, uh, you know, to, to, to get the word out and, and do more of what you're doing that's already unique. Uh, and then other. There are other factors that um, make a difference. If you're grandfathered in from an accreditation standpoint in a state that's impossible to get a state license, um, you know, those are, those are things that have a tremendous amount of incremental value to a, uh, to a new buyer that they couldn't otherwise get or they couldn't replicate on their own. Flip here. All right, um, growth is the next part. And, and this is what's kind of fun about uh, 2021 versus last year. Most schools are, are, are looking at a environment right now where, where growth is, is, a, is a reality for us. Um, and, and what's driving growth? Certainly the economic cycle is, uh, is, is gonna be favorable. You know, there, are, there are more unemployed people today than there were a year ago and so there are, there are career switchers and job seekers that are out there that are gonna consider going back to school. And so, you know, I've, I've sort of broken this down into sort of three big buckets, you know, value, brand, and, and sustainable growth. Um, in, in the projects that I've been involved with and I'm, and I'm looking at uh, doing currently, we talk about student return on investment. So not just what is the cost to the student, not the tuition um, or, or the fees that they're, that they're paying or are being billed for, but what's, you know, what's the out-of-pocket cost of that education relative to the outcome that they're gonna get when they, when they leave. Um, we're talking a lot about student debt and whether it's gonna be $50,000, which Biden's already shut down, or $10,000 or something in between. Um, that is sort of part of the, the student return on investment. You know, how much debt is that student going to graduate with? How much student debt did they come to you with before, um, you know, before they even uh, you know, touched your institution? And then what's the, you know, what's the outcome for them? If it's something like um, you know, going to uh, you know, become a, a physician, um, you know, 
becoming a doctor is a is a is a big deal. It's a ten plus year commitment because you've got to go through undergrad and then you've got to go through four years of medical school, and then at least three years of residency. You've got to figure out how to pay for all of that. So if you're going to graduate and you're going to have four hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, um, your job when you graduate better be able to service that um, uh, service that debt and Good news, you know, doctors make pretty good starting salaries in the United States, and student loan default rates are, are less than one percent on uh, on that taken broadly across all the medical schools that are that are out there. So that's a good example of a of a strong return on investment. Um, and by the way, a highly motivated student uh, to boot. Um, brand matters as well. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, and this is not to uh, to, to speak. Uh, Good or or bad, um, but when there was only one or two uh, names out in the market uh, doing online education, um, it was easy to find those brands. Um, now that uh, there's been more uh, equal distribution of of online learning and online education, and more people doing it, um, brand has become a little bit more important. I, I would be surprised if. Um, the University of Phoenix isn't facing more uh, competition for many of their online programs from traditional universities, and that it's probably different by market. If you're in the Northeast, I'll bet you that uh, you know Southern New Hampshire is a, is a much more formidable uh, competitor because in New England, people already have name recognition of that institution independent of its uh, Super Bowl ad campaign. Um, if you are in Texas, and uh, Texas A&M is doing r local and regional marketing for an online program, my guess is that the lead flow is going to move higher to Texas A&M than it's going to, to southern New Hampshire, for example. Um, so there are more brands out there now, um, and they tend to be um, certainly national, but it's the, it's the local awareness, it's the regional awareness that is tending to drive more enrollment and more inquiry and more uh, sort of sticky uh, applications that are, that are going into those institutions. So if you have a good brand and you have good regional uh, awareness of it, um, that's something that, that obviously helps position you for growth because the information seekers are typing in the name of your institution and your region um, into, the, uh, you know, into the interwebs. Um, and then the next one is, is sort of sustainable growth. And part of this is sort of the stability of your institution. Um, how long have you been in the market? Um, how strong are, you know, your student reviews that are, that are online? Um, you know, so brand value and, and sort of the, the stability or, or sustainability of your institution are, are all things that, uh, that, that certainly help, uh, help factor in valuation. Um, so, this one is, uh, is, is lifted directly from uh, the uh, BMO uh, every fall does a back to school uh, guide that I'm sure most, uh, most people on the phone have, uh, have, have received or seen copies of over the years. So if uh, you're not on the list to, uh, to follow uh, you know, Bank of Montreal Capital Markets, um, you, should, uh, you should reach out to, uh, to their banker and get on their list. Uh, but this really emphasizes the impact of, of two things. Um, the additional scrutiny and regulation that was being uh, pushed uh, throughout the Obama administration and the reality of you know, a, a very, very long, strong economy where we had full, uh, full employment or close to full employment in that sort of uh, you know, 17, 18, 19 period. Um, and the number of, of school closures, of college closures, um, you would think would would you know would would be kind of shocking. Um, a lot of people don't didn't realize the volume or the uh, the, the number of closed institutions until you kind of see it in this uh, in this graphic representation. What what's important to me about this is it, it really emphasizes the need to grow or go. Um, so either your institution is creating value by producing graduates that are getting jobs in your, in your region or market, um, so you're aligned to what the employment needs are of the, of the local um, economy, or you're not. Um, if you are, then you should be using that relationship and those outcomes with your students and those employers 
to ask the next level question, which is how else can we be helping, right? If you're a, if you're a partner with a, a logistics company and um, you are creating grads that are going and working in their business office, um, and you also have a truck driving uh, commercial driver's license program to kind of create more on the road truckers, um, you should be asking how else you can help them. Uh, if you are a allied health school and you're doing a great job of creating medical assistance and phlebotomists in the, in the market that you're offering in, there's probably opportunities for you to be doing continuing education and constantly be tasking your team to you know, find, find incremental ways to better serve the market and the, uh, the employers that are, that are there that are already hiring your graduates. And if you're not, um, you, should, you should be looking to, to make a change. Um, and, and that change could be selling your institution so that somebody with new energy and capital can come in. Um, or in sort of the worst case scenario, if you're, uh, you know, if you're making the best buggy whips around and you're running a buggy whip uh, driving uh, school, um, you've probably been passed by and it's probably time to hang it up. Um, and, you know, of course, other things have happened in the, uh, in the interim here where some schools just, you know, they, they close for a lot of different reasons. But mostly it was the economy and, uh, and higher levels of regulation. Um, but I would argue, um, you know, not preparing to adapt to the future um, by not having new program growth, not having uh, good relationships with those employers in market, um, you know, sort of started the, uh, you know, started the inevitable. All right, attractive segments, uh, and and this is sort of you know very very topical. We talked about healthcare, um, you know, sort of this uh, this post 9/11 return to first responders as uh, as good careers. Post COVID, um, really emphasizing uh, you know a variety, not just nurses and doctors, but respiratory therapists, uh, physical therapists, um, you know, medical assistants. You know, I've I've talked to a lot of school operators over the last. Uh, year and a half and the um, the excitement around um, inbound energy from potential new applicants is as high as I can remember it ever being um, especially for healthcare schools trades we've you know and there have been some really good uh, examples recently without uh, violating any kind of uh, confidentiality but a number of trade schools have uh, have changed hands uh, over the last three or four years um, there's a reason that we have, uh, you know, 50 plus year old uh, welders um, as the average age in this country, and we need more of those types of training programs. Um, technology is still continuing to expand. I look at technology in a couple of different ways. I still feel like the emergence of the stackable credential, um, you know, what, you know, back during uh, Y2K were Fortran programmers and uh, Microsoft certified engineers. Um, maybe we need fewer Fortran uh, people today, but the ability to sort of come and go in and out of, uh, of different uh, industry accepted certifications uh, is something that's, that's going to continue to, uh, to evolve as, as technology obviously continues to. Um, adult learners are going to be coming back to school again. Um, a number of people who were otherwise employed in, in, in good jobs uh, when we were at full employment before COVID, um, you know, are, are out of work right now and looking for what that next thing is going to be. And so the schools that have experience and, and really know that customer segment, if you know a 30-year-old, um, you know, uh, online, you know, or, or non-online learner and can, can help pivot them to be successful and help them get a job, um, that, is, uh, that is a unique, valuable uh, niche that you're playing in. Um, and then obviously, you, you know, unique things too. You know, if you're in a market and next door to you is a, uh, is a wind power turbine uh, manufacturing facility, um, there's, there's obviously training opportunities there. If your school is embedded at a hospital um, and, uh, and, and now they, they need more respiratory therapists, that's, you know, that's an opportunity for you to just jump right in and, and help partner with, uh, with those types of programs. Um, so, a lot of times on these uh, on these conversations, we have um, you know people who are kind of like, well, what are some 
what are some examples that are that are out there and kind of you know what's what's a good predictor of uh of of purchase price multiples or valuations on on companies and things like that and so uh this slide is is more just to uh to to show a, a few um publicly available uh uh you know pieces of information that are that that are out there that have been disclosed um and i like this uh this this very colorful uh ekg chart um that sort of shows what um the two year performance of um both K through 12 uh, corporate training, and then uh, S and P against uh, also uh, U.S. post-secondary uh, colleges, and kind of what's been happening. Um, but the interesting thing in this uh, in this chart is the uptick um, in all of those, with maybe the exception of of software or e-service after the election. So, despite the fact that we have um, Democratic control of Congress and the White House, um, there was certainly an uptick after the election, and and I think that that points to um, investor interest. It points to optimism, um, and and certainly those have those have continued to uh, you know to hold. If we take a look at sort of all of the public post secondary companies, um, they're trading kind of in the in the mid seven range on average. Um, there are there are higher uh, valuations in that and, and lower valuations in that, um, but uh, three transactions that have been sort of uh, you know over the last few years um, that have been announced. Um, of course, the first one, uh, Ed Talum's announcement of uh, of Walden being spun out of uh, Laureate, um, was a estimated uh, eight and eight point four times uh, EBITDA. I'm sure the uh, the Walden people have a uh, different uh, number uh, or purchase price multiple within their shop, and the Ad Talon people probably have a different uh, rationalization within within theirs. Um, but that's what's sort of uh, you know sort of out there, and obviously that's still pending, um, hasn't closed yet. Um, Altus and uh, St. Augustine, which was another laureate spin out, um, was uh, was 11.6 times. Um, that one had some really interesting attributes to it. Um, because it was 100% healthcare, um, you know, it was mostly uh, you know run through through one site, but a but a large site of scale. Um, Altus, by the way, is a Canadian uh, equity group uh, that has a stated um, sort of long hold period in in their funds. Um, typically, private equity investors are are working within a 10-year fund life. But are generally wanting to see velocity of investments buying and selling, um, you know, kind of in a four to six year sort of sweet spot. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that uh, if you're investing in private post secondary and you're trying to time the exit perfectly, um, that doesn't really exist. Um, the economy changes, uh, administrations change, um, and, uh, and and very very infrequently are you uh, are you in a position to sort of say. Okay, it's year five. We want to uh, we want to get out of our uh, out of our company. Um, so a firm like an Altus that has sort of a longer fund life, uh, you know, as as a uh, as a philosophy, I think is is something that will benefit uh, more investment in private post secondary. Um, and I think you're going to see more longer term investors uh, turn their gaze on uh, on our sector and on our industry because long term. You can't argue with the value of uh, incremental adult education, whether it's a associate degree or a, or a doctorate, um, on the premium over a high school education, certainly. And um, and in the the areas that we talked about, in technology, in trades, in healthcare, um, and in unique segments, uh, for sure, um, nothing but uh, nothing but growth in front of us. And so um, you know the the need for higher education is is there. So the fundamentals. Continue to to support it, so a longer term investor is, uh, is is less apt to get stuck in one of those uh, those down cycles. And then the last one is the merger hey, between hey. Uh, Capella and Strayer at uh, eight point six times. Hey Dave, Dave, Dave this is Aaron. I, look, I was wondering if you could just take a minute to uh, you know I this is so intuitive to you, and I know you've thought about this. It's been part of your vocabulary for so many years. But could you unpack for our listeners for just a sec when you talk about a multiple? 
an EBITDA and a purchase price valuation. I mean, there's a formula here, like I said, that I know is in your DNA, but could you just pull that apart a little bit and, and let, because there may be folks on the line who don't, aren't as familiar with this notion of, of valuing a school or building a purchase price based on a multiple of EBITDA. Yeah, you bet. Um, so, uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, EBITDA, uh, best way to, you know, the definition of EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So it's a, you know, it's a fancy financial acronym. Um, EBITDA won't show up on an audit anywhere. It's not, uh, you know, it's not GAAP. It's not generally accepted accounting principles. It's just, a, you know, it's just a, an acronym that uh, most folks that have, that have got, you know, sort of the finance hat um, like to use. Best way to think about it is sort of operating profit. Not net income, but sort of the operating profit or the cash flow of, um, of these businesses. Um, so EBITDA equals cash flow, and it's just a, a, a measuring stick to sort of guide, um, you know, how much uh, profitability the, the, the business has. And all public companies um, report their quarterly revenue and their quarterly operating profit, and obviously they have a stock price. And so when we talk about sort of the, the valuation for a public company, it's extremely transparent. The, the market sets the price. Um, you know, the, the people who are holding the stock, the, you know, you can look it up uh, at any point on, on any day and see that, you know, this stock is trading for $50 a share or $100 a share, and um, you basically take the total number of, of that market cap and divide it by, you know, the EBITDA to get your valuation. Um, there's, there's a debt factor in there, too, but... Um, you know, if public companies are trading, you know, in the in the seven to eight times range, these other transactions that are that are sort of listed here would sort of, you know, say, okay, so if a public company is trading at eight times, uh, here's two examples of acquisitions that are, you know, in that range, and one that's much higher. Um, and the question should be, you know, why was St. Augustine so much higher? And you know, at the end of the day, you get a buyer and a seller, and they agree upon a price. Obviously, the buyer of St. Augustine thought it was, was worth a lot to them um, to have in their portfolio. Um, and, and, and so the EBITDA not, multiples are, are really just the purchase price of, of an asset divided by the EBITDA to kind of come up with those, with those numbers. And Dave, is it fair to say, I mean, my experience has been, and, and I'm interested in your thoughts, it's fair to say that that um, acquiring institutions will often, when trying to think about what they believe would be a fair purchase price, even when the acquisition involves private entities. So we're not talking about public institutions, publicly traded institutions of higher education, but private institutions of higher education. A buyer may still be thinking in terms of profitability or EBITDA or something akin to EBITDA and a multiple of EBITDA when trying to determine what a rational purchase price would be. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And, and the reason that um, I, and, and generally, you know, folks that are, that are doing this, this type of work in the space sort of default to EBITDA as the, as the measuring stick, um, it, it, it's because our type of, of industry in our business um, generally has profitable operations. Um, there are plenty of other industries, you know, uh, biopharmaceuticals or software companies um, that don't have profitability. And in that case, many of those companies are based on um, multiples of their revenue. Um, you know, if you were to translate sort of a revenue multiple um, out, of, out of the examples that we've put here, you know, you're talking about a revenue multiple that can be anywhere from a half to maybe two times the revenue um, of a company uh, from a valuation standpoint. Got it. Yeah, just it's interesting because I we get this question frequently from folks who um, haven't had a lot of experience in mergers and acquisitions of institutions, and they, they say, well, what's how do you know what a 
an appropriate valuation would be. And um, and we're going to talk a little more about the in the private nonprofit setting here in a second. But whether whether you're talking about private proprietary institutions or private nonprofit, et cetera, this notion of looking at, at to your point, profitability and taking some multiple of that uh, is is sort of a tried and true way that is often used, particularly on the private proprietary side, to come up with a purchase price. Yeah, and, and the other the other folks who use EBITDA um, are lenders. Um, you know, if you're going, you know, if you, if you have cash burning a hole in your pocket, um, and you want to buy something and pay all cash for it and not finance it, um, you know, good for you. But generally, you know, most most acquisitions are going to come with with some some amount of leverage, some amount of debt that can be put on the balance sheet that will be supported by the cash flow of what you're buying. So a bank, for example, may say um, in the in the case of um, you know the the, the Altus valuation of uh, of St. Augustine at 11.6 times, um, a bank may say you know look we're we really like the the strong cash flows and the stability of this acquisition. Um, we're going to underwrite uh, four you know four times EBITDA, and then you know obviously the you know the math there is you have to come up with you know 7.6 times um, of, of equity to, you know, to match that, to, to kind of finance the acquisition. Um, but, but banks are always going to be, you know, looking at, you know, that number, um, that EBITDA of the, of the underlying thing that's going to be bought, um, because that's, you know, that, that's what they're going to base their, uh, their ability to underwrite credit, um, and, and debt capacity based. Very good. I, this is all terribly interesting to me. I, we really appreciate it. So, d are, Dave, are you off to? Are you jetting off to your premiere in Hollywood somewhere, or whatever other I thing am, it is uh, that you? You know, have and, to and do? I know it's a little. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I've got about ten more minutes. I can uh, I, I can hang on here. All right. Well, hang hang out, and um, and I may uh, kick something over to you here, or if you hear me get something wrong, by all means, jump in. Um, but with your leave, I'll I'll talk a little bit here about valuation and nonprofit M and A. Um, so we know, uh, you know, it's two th two points I want to make, and I was trying to get at this a little bit in, in the conversation that Dave and I were just having. And the first is, you know, if you're listening in and you're a private nonprofit or someone who's in that nonprofit space, you may be thinking, well, a lot of what Dave just had to say that sounds very specific to the career school proprietary set. Um, and, and I would suggest that that's not entirely the case. So it is true, you know, 10 years ago, if you talked about M&A and post-secondary education, you were talking almost exclusively about sort of proprietary side or publicly traded entities, because that's where all the, the merger and acquisition activity was happening. That is certainly not the case now. I mean, Emily and I have speculated that on any day of the week about, you know, we might be working on 10 to 15 transactions at any given point, and I don't know, a third to half of those now are involve private nonprofit entities. There, there's a tremendous amount of merger and acquisition activity happening in the nonprofit sector. It's driven from different. It's coming from a different place, and I want to be clear to acknowledge that it tends to be, as you'll see in the slide in our conversation, much more a product of the contraction and consolidation that's happening in higher education in general. Right. So it's not so much, and, and part of that is because when you have a private nonprofit entity, there are only so many ways that an investor can invest in that institution um, in a way that would that would make sense for the investor. Right. So the folks who are out there acquiring proprietary institutions, um, their end game, which is to have some way of benefiting from that investment, it doesn't work quite the same way on the private nonprofit side. So what motivates and drives the transactions is different. But it is still the case that there are many transactions, mergers of private nonprofit institutions and acquisitions of assets of private nonprofit institutions by other private nonprofits that are happening right now. And that is often because you've got uh, an institution that's, that is struggling for some reason. Maybe it's having cash flow problems. There's something about its economic model that doesn't work. Its overhead may be uh, just too much to sustain given where its revenues are and enrollments are. But – you know, it's got a long history and a great mission and a great brand and, and, and to Dave's point, some very unique assets. And this is, this is where I was going with this. So those types of things that Dave was talking about that are value drivers 
on the proprietary career school side, right? Is there something about you that's unique? Um, are you in healthcare? Is your model scalable? You know, all of those things, if you've got a private nonprofit university or college that's large and well healed and is interested in a potential acquisition or merger of another smaller private nonprofit that may be struggling and looking for a partner, those are the kinds of things that the, that the acquiring entity is going to be looking at, right? They're interested in whether that smaller private nonprofit, again, has unique assets, is offering programming in spaces that are attractive, like healthcare. Is it scalable? Is there some reason that, you know, with, with some efficiency around administrative services and overhead, that they could, the larger university, if it acquired the smaller institution and assimilated it, could drive more enrollments and make it more profitable? And I use that word profitable. I am talking about nonprofits, but I have a very good friend who worked in the private nonprofit space for many, many years, and she used to say, um, just because I'm not for profit doesn't mean I'm for loss, right? So, so it, as you all know who work at private nonprofit institutions, the hope is still to be profitable. You're just doing something different with those profits when they're made. You're putting them back into the institution. Um, but all of those value drivers that Dave referenced, clean regulatory, you know, str sound and, and reasonable financial, all of those things are important when you're talking about evaluating a private nonprofit transaction as well. Now, the thing that is really different in our experience, and this is just based sort of anecdotally on, on what we've seen, but again, we've been doing a fair volume of private nonprofit work in recent years, is that the consideration is very different. So, you know, we were just talking about a purchase price, and usually you're talking about that can be accomplished, it may be cash, it may be some combination of other things, but there's still this notion that there is um, consideration that's being paid by the buying entity to the selling entity, right, in those transactions. Um, on the private nonprofit side, uh, what we're seeing more typically is that um, there is not a cash consideration involved. So just hypothetically, you know, you have a, a smaller private nonprofit institution that is attractive for many reasons, but for some reason they're looking for a partner, they want to merge into a larger entity, um, their model is not sustainable on their own, even though they've got a lot of very interesting positive things about their mission and history and programming, et cetera. Um, so what will often happen in our experience is the larger institution will, will you know, and we're going to talk about models here in a minute, um, either through an acquisition of assets or an amendment of governance documents or what have you, assimilate that smaller institution. And in doing so, it will make, uh, it will pledge to do certain things, right? Maybe that's um, some form of pre-close bridge financing, maybe that's uh, pre-close services that are being offered, back-end services, financial aid, enrollment recruiting support, curriculum design, you name it, even before the transaction is consummated. Or maybe it's some suite of services and, and, and assistance post-close. But the key point is, instead of paying a cash consideration, the larger entity essentially says, you know, we're going to offer these services, this bridge financing, some form of financial support, uh, et cetera, um, and that's the consideration um, for the transaction. And so it's an exchange for all those things that we're going to offer you that you would, uh, the smaller institution that's being assimilated, I'll call them the seller here, uh, it's for those reasons and that type of consideration that they would engage in the transaction. The, the exception to this that we have seen is where the selling entity um, believes or the parties believe that there, there may be some creditor or other entity involved with the seller that would be uncomfortable with uh, and, and potentially even claim something like a fraudulent transfer uh, if, if there was a cashless transaction, right, if there were no consideration at all. Because what, and I'll give you an example, let's say you had a, a selling entity um, and they had an extremely large contract pursuant to which, you know, a, a significant sum was going to be owed over multiple years. And the acquiring university, and we're talking about private nonprofits on both sides, but the larger private nonprofit entity said, we, you know, we think this is a great partnership. We're going to assimilate. We're going to acquire your assets and your institution, your college is going to become a part of our university. But when we do that, when we acquire those assets, we're not going to acquire that contract that you have because we don't want that contract. You know, maybe that contract is for some service that we already have in-house or we have another provider that provides it. So we're going to reject that contract. And the concern is after the transaction is consummated, 
the other party to that contract that got rejected might sue and say, well, wait a minute. They just, they just, that wasn't a real sale of the assets. The, the, the smaller institution, the selling institution with which I had this contract, they just gave their assets away to get out of this contract. And so they're claiming essentially a fraudulent transfer or something along those lines. In that case, among others, but certainly in that case, uh, we've seen private nonprofit institutions be quite deliberate about um, getting fair market valuations, right? And as a general matter, a private nonprofit, when it sells its assets, is the expectation is it's going to get fair market value for those assets. Unless, and this is all governed by individual state law, so I'm speaking in general terms, but and generally it is allowed if the if private nonprofit, the seller, wanted to contribute its assets, if if it would if the entity that's receiving them is still advancing its mission. So in other words, if you've got two institutions of higher education and one wanted to contribute its assets to another uh, without consideration, typically you could do that. But if you're trying to guard against a fraudulent transfer claim or something like that, then um, in that case, you may need to pay consideration, meaning the acquiring entity. And if it does that, it's probably going to use a fair market valuation. And the way you get a fair market valuation is you go out to – there are a number of firms these days and organizations um, that are happy to be hired by institutions of higher education to prepare a fair market valuation. And our experience has been this is sort of an evolving discipline. I, I don't think 15 years ago there was much need to produce fair market valuations of private, nonprofit, traditional institutions of higher education is a going concern. Um, but now, with these mergers and acquisitions occurring, there is a, a more frequent need. And as a consequence, there are providers out there who are developing um, methodologies for arriving at those types of uh, fair market valuations. So it's, it's very different from, in some respects, it's quite different from what Dave was, was talking about. Um, but on the other hand, when you're talking about – so how you get at those numbers, how you get to the actual consideration and whether there even is a cash consideration is quite different. But when you're talking about how to determine value and whether you know, the entity producing a fair market value is, is, is looking at certain factors or whether the acquiring institution of higher education is trying to decide um, just how interested they are, those same types of value drivers that Dave mentioned uh, we find also are, are quite present in um, in the private nonprofit context as well. So with all of that having been said, uh, Emily, I think it's time to uh, move on from, from valuations and to move into the structure conversation. And I will pitch it to you maybe just to talk about the prelude to M&A success. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really invaluable. Thank you so much, Dave and Aaron. It's, I find it fascinating as well. And you know, as you said, there's a number of reasons to do these transactions and, you know, always good to look at, you know, the, the environment and, you know, demographics, um, enrollments, et cetera, COVID, things that hit us nationwide um, that are driving these uh, types of transactions to increase. So uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes here. I, I, you know, I'm mindful of the time, and I've got some pretty exciting slides in the back here that I can't wait to get to. Uh, but I figure we'll do a couple of building blocks and some blocking and tackling on the corporate side. So uh, let's let's go ahead and, and look at some prerequisites for M&A success. So you'll see here are some of the themes that Aaron and I have seen throughout of you know our all of our transactions um, that lead to a successful uh, closing, whether it's a merger acquisition or or other strategic transaction. Uh, you know, really critical is for the parties to have that vision, that strategy. Uh, what is the goal of the transaction? It's got to be better than the status quo. Both parties have to get something out of this transaction. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't be going through all of this effort, the regulatory change of ownership process, et cetera. So you want to make sure that everybody is aligned. You know, I've had the experience where we started to work on this uh, merger, and then halfway through, you know, one of the parties said, well, now that I think about it, it's maybe not so great, and maybe we're okay on our own. And I said, all right, that's totally fine, but, you know, you want to go through the, you know, it's important to go through this process, but to make sure you're on the same page and ensure that there are, are very important concrete benefits to both sides um, that will lead to a successful closing and a, and a partnership together. Um, another thing that is, you know, sort of critical is the experienced team of advisors. Um, here, you know, when you have 
um, whether it's bankers, accountants, uh, attorneys who are well-versed in the space, understand the regulatory framework, understand the multiples that you're able to get and understand the timeline to get to a closing. I mean, that's just going to make the entire process a lot faster um, and a lot more successful. Uh, we've come across uh, some transactions where, you know, the advisors are not in the higher ed space, so, you know, they may not understand the, the financial ratios, composite scores, things like that, or, you know, or maybe it's a, a corporate attorney who doesn't really do a lot of nonprofit work, so they're not familiar with the contribution roles and, you know, all of the attorney general approvals and things like that that could apply. So um, it, it really is critical. you got to get higher ed attorneys, um, accountants, you know, and, you know, like Aaron said, we work with valuation firms um, who know how to value higher ed assets like faculty and curriculum, things that, you know, may not be uh, the forte of a, a just a regular valuation firm that's used to looking at widgets or, or things like that. Um, this third block here about cash flow, quantified business value, uh, you know, it kind of goes along the theme of having enough runway. Um, having enough of that cash flow on a monthly basis to get you where you want to go. Um, and that ties into the strong management team, you know, and, and, you know, Dave mentioned how a very strong management team increases your valuation. Well, it also increases your success, hood, you know, your likelihood of success of completing a transaction. It's, you know, you're going to need leadership. You're going to need, uh, you know, organization. You're going to need people who are able to execute. Um, and get your team uh, to the to the finish line. And the last and probably most important thing you see right there at the end is time. You know, uh, uh, while we see some accreditors moving to rolling meetings to approve these changes changes of ownership, you know, a lot of them are still operating on a three meeting per year schedule. So you've got to wait for June or you've got to wait for November. Uh, states can take a year. Uh, you know, you've got regional accreditors, what have you. So you really want to build in enough time to get those regulatory approvals in place. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, in an unregulated industry, you could sign a contract and sign and close the same day because you don't have to get, depart you know, you don't have to get uh, a regional creditor approval or, or something else before you close. Uh, but a as we all know, this is a high highly regulated space and, uh, you know, you really want to build in enough time to get everybody uh, across the finish line and, and still be standing when you're done. I'll, and Emily, while you're switching to the next slide here, Thank I'll you. add, yeah. particularly for the private nonprofits and that side of things, we, we said strong management team. I mean, having a sophisticated board and and or whatever your governance structure, if you've got a two-tier governance, whatever, but, ha you know, at, at your board level, having folks with sophistication who can evaluate proposals um, – Boy, is just critical. I, you know, we've done some M and A with very small schools where they were the targets, and um, you know, they had very bright and and uh, uh, committed board members, but folks who just had no no merger and acquisition type experience, which meant that their governing body just had no capacity to really evaluate proposals and understand the transaction beyond what advisors were telling them. But, but no one on the board had that kind of capacity. You know, with large, sophisticated institutions, I mean, that's not going to be an issue. But some of the targets in these, in these particularly private nonprofit sort of merger transactions right now can be very small regional entities um, that may not have anyone on their board who has that kind of experience. And that makes it a lot harder to get across the finish line. So another prerequisite, I won't say it's a prerequisite to success, but I'll say something that's extremely helpful is if you, if you have a board that is prepared and capable to manage a transaction. Really great point. All right, so I'm going to go to third-party sale fundamentals. And here, I think we really just want to point out on this slide, there are a number of different post-secondary transactions um, today, we're focusing on the third-party sale, merger, or transfer. Um, so this is kind of an, a, a, an arm's length with a, you know, with a third, third party that's unrelated uh, to the current entity. But you'll see there's a number of different strategic transactions uh, that other institutions may pursue. And we can you know, roll out a whole webinar, webinar series, on, series on all of these. Um, but for today, we'll focus our, our scope on the third-party sales. All right. and I would and say, so, Emily, you know, what do you think? We, I mean, not, 
I was just going to say, Emily, what, um, 95 percent of the transactions we see are probably third party sales, fair to say, uh, involving, you know, an outside third party as opposed to one of the other models. Yes, I completely agree with that. And, you know, this is a, you know, for reasons we'll discuss, this is a preferred uh, option for many schools. It's just the, the best path, path forward for the institution and, and for the mission. So it does seem to be a good solution. If, if status quo is not, uh, you know, feasible for any reason, um, the third party sale or strategic transaction is a, a really good path forward for a lot of institutions. And so we're just going to break it down here very quickly. You know, when, when it comes to third party structures, I mean, we talked about, you know, M&A is mergers and acquisitions, but for, for the most part, uh, we're seeing these take place in two ways, and that's the asset sale and the equity sale. And so the asset sale, just think of a buyer as acquiring the assets, meaning, you know, you're listing out the desks and pencils and faculty and curriculum and programs. You got to list all of that stuff out and, you know, um, depending on, you know, if there's an allocation or valuation issue, you're assigning a value to each one of those items. And the seller is the school, meaning the corporate entity that owns the, the regulatory institution. In an equity sale, it's the sale of shares or membership interests. So meaning that legal entity that's holding the school stays exactly where it is and it's in place. But the ownership of the school is changing hands, whereas the stock certificates are going to someone else. All right, and so I, I think here we're going to just walk through a couple of the most common transactions that we see here. Um, and I, I want everyone to think about, you know, Aaron and I always stay in our own lanes, okay? So Emily is corporate, Aaron is regulatory. And so there can be a corporate legal structure for legal, you know, for legal purposes. And then there can be a regulatory consideration as well. So here on this slide before you, you'll see an asset sale without institutional integration. So we've got the, the illustration here, which I, I love all of these, and, and Aaron is our architect of these, and I, I think they're fantastic. I'm a visual learner. Um, you'll see here ABC School is a for-profit selling legal entity. It holds ABC School, which has the OPE ID 1 and some assets. XYZ is our buyer for profit, and it has its own school, OPE ID 2. And you'll see after the closing, we will sell the assets of ABC to XYZ, and that OPE ID is going to stay intact, but it's going to be owned by the XYZ for profit legal entity. So this is called without an institutional integration because that OPE ID 1 is still in place, um, still exists, um, but it just operates under the XYZ school legal entity. This is, I just want to draw the contrast with an asset sale with an institutional integration. Here you'll see the same thing, ABC School Inc. sells those assets to XYZ School, but you'll see that OPE ID 1 disappears. And so XYZ School and ABC School, meaning the regulatory institutions teaching those programs, are going to operate under OPE ID 2. And so that OPE ID goes away and uh, XYZ School, a legal entity, holds both of those schools and operates under one OPE ID. And the regulators and accreditors are familiar with both types of these asset sales. So you'll see from a corporate perspective, it's an asset sale. But when you get to the regulatory side, and sometimes this confounds our clients because you, only, you almost have too many regulatory options. You could do an institutional integration or you could do it without. And there are reasons that you could, you know, choose one over the other. But the regulator, you know, in our experience, the regulators and the accreditors are pretty flexible in terms of working with you in, in what you want to accomplish after the closing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in here and say, you know, actually, go back to that prior slide. Sure. I just, oh, you know, okay. what's, what's, what? <laughs> one more time. No, I, I won't it, touch you, do it, Emily. But there you go. Okay. So, go what, uh, you know, to Emily's point, this can be confusing when you're having this conversation with lawyers and regulators, but it's, an, it's a really valuable point. It's a, because it illustrates the extent to which the, the corporate legal structure and the regulatory structure um, are sort of thought of differently, right? right? As Emily pointed out on this slide, what you're seeing is from a corporate legal standpoint, this is a, an asset acquisition, right? XYZ School Inc. is acquiring the assets of ABC School, you know, the assets that comprise the school itself, 
from ABC School Inc., from another corporate entity. But if you presented this to regulators, if you went to one of your regional creditors, if you go to the U.S. Department of Education, they're going to think of this as a, quote, institutional merger. We, we like to stay away from that word. The reason we use integration, we do that deliberately, because merger is a different kind of corporate transaction, and it confuses things. What you've got here is an acquisition of assets, but from a regulatory standpoint, the integration of two institutions, so that after the dust settles and this transaction is accomplished, you're only left with one regulated institution of higher education, XYZ School. And now what used to be ABC School is just a branch of XYZ School, right? And we see this all the time right now, this model in particular, both in the, in, and we've seen it for years on the career school proprietary side, but this is also a very common model on the private nonprofit side, right? So you've got a large university. This is our XYZ school in this model, right? We'll say university XYZ, and they say, hey, ABC College, which is in the one town over, they're a conservatory. They've got this wonderful music program. We've always wanted a music program. They're, they're looking to merge with someone. They're looking for some way to make things work. And, and we, we think this could be a wonderful partnership. So we're going to acquire, we, XYZ University, we're going to acquire the assets that comprise that conservatory, ABC Conservatory. But what we're going to do is we're going to make it a branch of XYZ University. We're going to extend our regulatory approvals, our OPEID, our regional accreditation, et cetera, sort of over to cover the conservatory, right? And so now it will be a branch of XYZ University like any other branch campus of XYZ University. Maybe we'll continue to call it the conservatory of XYZ University, but it's an acquisition of assets with an institutional integration. Right, and that's like I said, it's very common right now on the private nonprofit side. So let me go. I think Emily, this is where I jump in. So let me let me just we'll talk about the equity concept. So those both of those prior slides involved acquisitions of assets. So in the proprietary context, we would call you know the equity concept. We would literally call an equity sale, and usually it involves the acquisition of stock. Right. So you can see here we've got an ABC parent corp. Uh, on one side of the transaction and an XYZ, XYZ parent corp on the other. And ABC right now has owns 100% of ABC School, Inc. So there are two legal entities over there, right? And one is a wholly owned subsidiary or the other. And ABC School, Inc. inside of it has ABC School. So that's the regulated entity, you know, all the assets that comprise the school. So XYZ, right, instead of acquiring those assets, it's just going to acquire the stock to ABC School, Inc., it's going to buy 100%. It's going to acquire 100% of the stock. And what that means is instead of taking those assets that comprise the school out of AB School, C School, Inc., as Emily was discussing earlier, we just take the entire legal entity, ABC School, Inc., and now it becomes a subsidiary of XYZ Parent Corp. Right? So that's an example of a, of a stock acquisition as opposed to an acquisition of assets. And you see the little box that says unrelated assets. I mean, as, as Emily has pointed out and I know is going to talk about here in a minute, when you do a stock acquisition, you get that whole legal entity and everything inside of it. Right? So when you, do, you acquire assets, you get to pick and choose. But when you acquire the, entire, the stock of the legal entity, you just get all of it, right? including any unrelated assets and anything else that's sitting inside that legal entity. What's interesting is there's also sort of an equivalent of a, of a stock acquisition on the private nonprofit side, and we see this as well. So in this case, we've got two nonprofits, right? You've got ABC College, which is a nonprofit, and again, XYZ University. And you can see right now, you've got two distinct legal entities, right? And then inside each of those legal entities, you've got a regulated entity or the school is recognized by the department and the accreditor, et cetera. And so what happens here is XYZ University, instead of acquiring the assets of ABC College, which you saw a couple of slides back, what they're going to do is they're going to say, we're, we're going to sign an agreement. And ABC College, pursuant to this agreement, ABC College Nonprofit Inc., is going to amend its articles of incorporation and its bylaws and its various governance documents. And it's going to turn itself into a sole member nonprofit corporation. And then, at the same time, they're going to agree to make us, XYZ University, the sole member. Right? So now, what's interesting is ABC College Nonprofit Inc. still exists after the transaction. They are still an independently governed, accredited, authorized, licensed institution of higher education. They, they're their own 501c3. They have their own independent board that governs them. But 
there's now this sole member of their corporation, and typically the sole member is going to have certain reserve powers under the bylaws. So they may be, have some say in appointing or removing board members. Uh, acquisitions of a certain size or procurements of a certain size may have to be approved by the board of XYZ University, um, and, you know, various other things along those lines. And you see this kind of structure all the time out in the world and have for many years uh, where you have faith-based institutions and you'll have a church that is the sole member of, of a faith-based college university or sometimes with hospitals, for example, that, uh, where there's a nursing school. And the nursing school may be an independent 501c3 that was created by a hospital many, many decades ago. And the hospital is the sole member of the 501c3 that contains and operates that nonprofit nursing school. So this concept of a sole member has been around a long time. It also exists in other nonprofit contexts as well, outside of higher education. Um, but it, the creation of a sole member is a way that you can ostensibly merge um, – or bring two institutions together. Now, keep in mind in this model, ABC College doesn't go away. The OPAD isn't retired. It continues to exist. But now you've essentially linked these two institutions through a governance structure. And, and we spoke earlier when you talk about consideration in a deal like this. You know, typically, in exchange for the control that ABC College is giving up, XYZ University is, is agreeing to provide, you know, various services or financial assurances or things of that nature, you know, something that makes it worthwhile for ABC College to enter into this kind of relationship. All right, Emily, how about selecting the right structure? So how do you pick and choose? All right. So there's a number of things that, you know, the board, the officers, um, everyone will want to take a look at as you're trying to decide what which is the right structure for you and, and your institution. Um, and you'll see here, I think I'll cover the first three here, Aaron, and then I'll turn it over to you for control governance and Title IV. Uh, but we'll fly through these so we get back to those cool structures. Um, so, it, you know, just from a corporate perspective, the asset sale can be more complex. You know, as we talked about, you could purchase substantially all of the assets and assume the liabilities from the seller, or you could cherry pick. Uh, you know, the negotiation of the purchase price uh, could have some complexities to it. There could be valuations involved or not, but there's more negotiations. Um, you know, and remember that seller is going to continue to exist after the sale, so it may be left with a few things. I don't know, it could be a couple of programs that were duplicative or maybe some, not all the staff made it over. And so the seller would be responsible for, for winding up those, uh, you know, unrelated assets that were in the, the gray box there. Um, the equity sale is, you know, when you exchange and you purchase those share certificates or those membership interests. Uh, this is a little, this is a little bit simpler on the operations side. You know, transition is a little bit easier since literally the name of the school, the entity, all the contracts and everything, the employer, all stay exactly the same. Um, you know, one thing I'll mention, I'll go back to the asset for a second. You know, when you do an asset sale, you do have to have the seller corporate entity terminate all of the faculty and staff. And then the buyer legal entity has to hire the selected faculty and staff, um, you know, all occurring on the same closing day. But we've had some, you know, anecdotes where, you know, the, the staff read the first page but didn't read the second page. It said you've been, you know, you're hired and congratulations, you've been fired. So it's important to read the whole letter uh, before you start to panic. Um, but all of that is not necessary in an equity sale because it'll just say, you know, everything is exactly the way it was the day before closing. It's just that the, the new owner of the company is, is the buyer. Um, and as Aaron said, uh, you know, a great overview of the sole membership. Um, I really like this one. I mean, it just requires the least amount of, you know, legal surgery and documentation. You know, we're amending the certificate of incorporation and the bylaws to provide for those powers and to set up that governance link between two entities that, for, for the most part, the operations and the transition are also much simpler, um, just, you know, kind of less of a heavy lift in terms of, of documentation um, and things like that. So that's on the complexity side. Um, liability, you know, one, one thing I want to say is, you know, we talk about mergers, and mergers aren't all that common. In fact, it's actually quite rare because it doesn't make sense from either party for a legal, for a legal purpose, uh, you know, to, to merge together. I'm thinking about that Seinfeld episode where um, Elaine's boss, uh, you know, they merge two water companies to become Molin Springs or some terrible name. So that typically doesn't make sense. Um, in the higher em education. Emily, Emily yeah. just to be clear, you're talking about a, a corporate merger, 
not an exactly. institution. You're, yeah, you're exactly. using merger right now to refer to the legal corporate concept yes. of merger. Exactly. We talk about um, mergers and acquisitions, right, M&A. We throw that around. But that corporate concept of two companies merging together is just is very rare in the higher ed space. And you'll almost always see it in the two ways that we've laid out, whether that's asset and equity um, sale. And the reason for that is because we can control the liability exposure for the parties that way, right? So in the asset sale, the buyer can cherry pick and assume assets and liabilities um, you know, out of a list, um, you know, and you've got a seller entity there. If anything were to go wrong, there's someone to pursue after closing. Um, in an equity transaction, uh, that liability still remains down at that corporate entity. So it's not, you know, the, the owner, whether it's a shareholder or a parent entity, is not exposed because the company, that company exists there to provide that limited exposure as a corporation or LLC or, or whatever it is. Um, and an important note there, um, you know, for for buyers that due diligence will be critical because, you know, as Aaron said, you're getting the whole kit and caboodle. So, you know, warts and all, uh, you want to make sure that you've turned over, you know, every rock to make sure you know what you're getting into. You're stepping right into the shoes of the seller. So you want to be aware of all operations and any hiccups that have occurred in the past. Um, and the sole membership is also great because you've, again, got that, you know, I'll say parent subsidiary structure, but of course, nonprofits don't have owners, but you've got two separate legal entities that are linked by this governance um, mechanic, but, um, but you've still got the assets and liabilities of, I'll call the target or the subsidiary, staying at that corporate entity, and the, the parent uh, does not have that exposure. Um, through that. So those, so those, the, the, you know, that's kind of a good overview of the reasons we kind of see these three transaction structures and the various liabilities that come with that. And I'll just take a quick minute to talk about tax. Um, you know, this is kind of, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but if you think about it, you know, the, the ABC Inc. is the seller, right? So, the cash proceeds are going to a seller, and that seller then has to distribute those proceeds to its owner or its shareholder. So here you'll see two layers of taxation. You've got the corporate level and then the, the shareholder level. Um, buyers love asset transactions because you get a basis step up in the acquired assets, and that's a favorable tax treatment um, for the buyers. And that can help increase your valuation. You could get a little bit more for your school in an asset transaction. Um, on the equity side, just remember this, the proceeds of any sale are going to the shareholder, right? So it's just a single layer of taxation. So the seller is the, the individual or the parent corporation, um, and there's that favorable capital gains treatment on the sale of shares or membership interests. Um, but you don't get the basis step up. Um, for the buyers. So it really just kind of depends. Um, it, it, all of this is on the for-profit side, of course, you know, talking about tax. We can get really fancy. There's something called a 338H10, which is a stock deal treated as an asset sale for IRS purposes, but there's all kinds of rules around it. It is very popular, though, because you can get your cake and eat it, too. I'll just, just a quick note about nonprofits. Um, of course, this is a very complex area. Uh, you know, you would not want to do anything that would potentially jeopardize the nonprofit status of either or both entities. So you want to be very careful here. Aaron and I work closely with our tax counsel on structuring each of this, these transactions to make sure that they're efficient um, and, you know, that just preserves the desired tax status of the entities. All right. Anything to add there on tax or – Go ahead. No, no, but I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna also just for our listeners. So we've got seven minutes left in the 90 minutes, and I've got two more of these transaction structure drivers I want to get to. So Emily talked about um, uh, uh, liability and uh, tax treatment, right? Um, and and I'm going to talk about governance and in uh, the Title IV piece. We have three uh, sort of structures at the end that we were going to go through, and he here's my, going to be my promise. I, I don't want to blow through that. Some of you may already feel like your heads are spinning, um, and if, if that is the case, trust me, you are in good company. This stuff is complicated. We spend hours on the phone with clients 
walking through all of this, talking about different options and different considerations, and then sometimes when you get four or five different proposals that, that a client may be evaluating, I mean, the conversations can be particularly wide-ranging and, and um, complicated. Uh, what I want to do is take the rest of the time to get through these couple of slides and then answer questions. And here is my promise to you. Um, Emily and I, and Emily can tell you, I, I'm very excited about uh, those last three slides, and here's what we'll do. Um, I don't know if we'll do it on YouTube, or maybe we'll just do a separate one-off webinar, but we will put together um, uh, those three plus a few more uh, structures that we think are particularly interesting, and we'll do a, another session, and, that's, and we'll just walk through structures in that session. And you can go back. We'll make sure everybody sees it. We'll get it out to you on the email, and you can go through it on demand free at your discretion. And like I said, we'll either record it or, uh, and post it to the website um, in this kind of format, or maybe we'll do something on YouTube. But we will make that happen. I promise you that. I just don't want to blow through it all so quickly that, that it just leaves everybody flabbergasted. You know, we try to talk these things out, but sometimes certain segments go longer than others or than anticipated. Okay. So we talked about when you're sitting and you're trying to evaluate what kind of structure to pick. Complexity is something you think about. Tax treatment, right? Liability and shielding yourself from liability is really important. You know, another one is control and governance. And there are trade-offs here with these two different types of structures that are important. When you do an asset sale, especially if you do an institutional integration, right? So if where you end up is the, the institution that's being acquired is now part of the larger institution. It's a unit or division of the larger institution. From a governance standpoint, um, and a control standpoint, that's great. And that makes life easier in a sense, right? Because now there was this college that was a separate 501c3 and it had its own board and, and governance structure. And when we acquired it and assimilated into our larger university and we covered it with our accreditation and it became a branch campus under o, our OPID, it, it no longer has its own board. I mean, maybe it's got an advisory council like all the colleges within your university or you know some sort of shared governance concept, but there's still only one board for the university. And there's one president of the university. And the president of the university is the president for that new college that you just acquired as well, right? Just like any other division or unit of your university. Maybe it has a dean, right? But you've got one president or chancellor for the university and one board. When you go with a, a sole membership structure or, or if you do an equity acquisition, if you're in a proprietary situation, um, you'll recall you're acquiring that subsidiary entity, that legal entity, and the school that's inside of it. And so the governance structure that is in place for that school that you're acquiring stays there. So if you execute on a sole membership, for example, Emily likes it, and I understand why from a corporate perspective, it's, it's easier to do. As she pointed out, there's fewer documents, it's less hassle, right? There's less change. On the other hand, when the dust settles after the transaction, now the university still has its board and operates like it always has, but remember, the, the other institution continues to be an independently licensed and accredited institution. It has a separate board, and it's got its own president, and it's got its own accreditor it deals with, and all of those things are still in place. It's got its own relationship with the Department of Education. And what that means is you, know, you have to be prepared on a go-forward basis to deal with a more complex governance and control structure. And if I'm the acquiring university, I want to be real thoughtful, even though it may take more work up front for the long haul, would I rather have a cleaner, more simplified governance and control structure that would come by virtue of an asset acquisition and creating a branch campus out of this smaller college? Um, and, and also, you know, for a selling entity, you may say to yourself, look, it's really important to us that our board and our institution uh, maintain its integrity and remain in place. We want a, uh, to have a relationship with a larger school, but we don't want to give up our identity as an independent regulated institution. And, and those types of considerations are critical and will drive your transaction structure. Right, um, and then of course there's there's the U.S. Department of Education, and there are lots and lots of considerations that come into play. I mean, this is why people call a guy like like me is because I I'm the one who spends lots of time thinking about all the the department and the accreditors and and how the regulators think about these transactions and what they're likely to approve or not approve, et cetera. Um, and sometimes those types of considerations whether a regulator will consider this a change of ownership or control, if they did, what types of conditions they might attach, whether there's some way to structure it so that it wouldn't be viewed as a change of ownership or control. All of those types of things are important to think through. Um, sometimes 
complexity, liability, and tax considerations trump the regulatory considerations, but not always. And, and that's why we label all of these as transaction drivers. When you're evaluating a structure, you want to have someone uh, in your team, a person who can speak to all of these and, and give you good counsel so that you can weigh them and you can understand, you know, given your vision for the transaction and where you want things to be at the end of the day, um, how you ought to structure it. So it, it, honestly, it's fascinating work. It's rewarding work. We love working with schools to come up with transactional structures that um, help everyone accomplish their goals in the most efficient way and avoid pitfalls. Um, and it is really wonderfully interesting and complex. So it's 3.30. Uh, Emily and I can stick around. Um, Dave had to go off to his Hollywood premiere, uh, but uh, we're happy to answer some questions, and I see that we do have some. Uh, so I'm going to try to moderate here. Emily, I'll throw these out, and we can see, um, see what we can do. So the first one, what are the options, best practices for a board that does not have prior transaction experience when preparing for a sale process? Um, I know my quick answer. Emily, what do you think? <laughs> my quick answer is to hire advisors who work in this space and can provide uh, summaries, uh, you know, regulatory advice, uh, you know, valuation advice, et cetera. So, uh, you know, and, and to have board presentation materials created so that the board can be educated. I mean, I, I, as you said, I think, you know, unless you're, uh, you know, a serial acquirer doing a roll-up, you know, a lot of times institutions, this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. It's not like something that institutions do every six months or every two years. Um, so certainly there are many boards out there that, you know, have not been through this process before. Uh, but I think that would be yeah. the advice. Uh, boy, I 100% agree. I mean, you can't manufacture experience, you know, you, you, the only thing you can do really is to go get it. And, and, and I think you need to be mindful of the type of, you know, what, what grouping of professionals you need, and that's really going to depend on the situation you're in. I mean, you know, in almost all circumstances, if you're planning on going through a merger or an acquisition, I mean, you're going to need, you know, corporate and regulatory counsel either in-house or, or outside. You're probably going to need an accountant who can help you uh, with some of these considerations and provide tax counsel, if not a tax attorney. Um, you know, a lot of the institutions we deal with now are uh, that are uh, – in both private nonprofit and on the proprietary side, um, I'd say in about half, maybe a third of our transactions, you know, the smaller institution is in some state of distress. And um, one of the things that can be really helpful, I, we have a colleague, Craig Dean, up in Chicago with AEG Partners. And my joke is every distressed institution needs a Craig Dean. And I think he loves that quote. I think he has it on a T-shirt because he's a guy who spent 35 years in the turnaround industry, right? And he's done work in higher education space. And he, you know, if you're in a place where your cash flow is tight and you've got limited runway and you've got folks like Aaron and Emily or your accountant or whoever trying to help you to get a transaction done, you may in the interim also need someone who can help you reduce expenses, manage creditor expectations, understand legal consequences, you know, if someone is trying to push you in the court or take action against you. And you might want somebody who can do those things for you as well. And if I think the likelihood of having someone on most boards with that kind of experience is extremely low. Um, I've been in a couple of those transactions where I mentioned Craig because I've worked with him, and I just <laughs> I can't imagine trying to do something like that without someone um, in, like him in this case. So I, I think it's not only do you need advisors, but pretty early on, depending on the situation you're in, you know, you want to make sure you're getting the right advisors and the right kind of advice. So it's, you know, getting getting the right combination of people to help you out. Um, let's see. Um, we have a lot of questions today. Uh, ah, so someone's asking about, um, so many of the examples Dave gave, he was talking about multiples, remember multiples of EBITDA, and they say, you know, many of the examples we saw were for, this is on the proprietary school side, for publicly traded entities, what would a typical valuation be for a smaller private transaction? I mean, I will tell you, based on my experience, and we see a decent volume of uh, transactions, certainly not the entire universe of them, but, you know, it, 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 it comes and goes. I would say right now anywhere between 
four and eight as a multiple of EBITDA if you were looking at a career school, understanding there could be, you know, folks on both sides of that range. And 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 the drivers to the multiple are very much the kinds of things that uh, Dave talked about. So, you know, if you are a large, uh, uh, squeaky clean uh, institution with an online platform that specializes in uh, healthcare education, you're a very attractive target right now. Right? I mean, you're exactly the kind of institution that someone who wants a larger online presence, including many private nonprofits and even public entities, uh, not publicly traded, I mean like uh, uh, public universities, flagships, um, many of them are interested in acquiring and expanding their online capabilities. And, and there could be an institution out there um, that is a great opportunity for them, uh, provides a great opportunity for them to do that. And, and in that kind of context, we see higher multiples. If you are a troubled institution with compliance concerns and not a lot of time to get a transaction accomplished and a program portfolio that maybe includes some things that are interesting but some things that aren't, I don't know, you might see two or three, right? But, but I think right now for the average institution, we see between four and eight. Um, let's see. Do you see most private schools um, <laughs> going for more or less than the average public multiple of 7.6. Well, I just said 4 to 8. So I would say, you know, 7.6 is on the higher side. But I think non-publicly traded proprietary institutions where you often do see that approach of a multiple of EBITDA, um, I think they're typically less than the publicly traded entities. You know, they've talked about size and scale and there being something attractive just about size itself. Um, but I think 4 to 8. So I put the average a little lower. Does type of a creditor impact valuation? Um, certainly, yes. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it should. I mean, I have good relationships with, with – uh, I think th there often is a distinction drawn um, rightly or wrongly between uh, accreditors of – career schools and accreditors of traditional institutions, although most of you on the phone know that these days many of the traditional regional accreditors are accrediting certain proprietary institutions and, and certainly many of the national technical accreditors that traditionally have accredited technical schools have nonprofit technical schools that they accredit. So there are lots of exceptions going both ways. But I think typically there has been in the market among buyers a preference for regional accreditation, all things being equal. And I'm not suggesting that that's right or wrong, but I do think that that is, uh, is the case. So whether you are a proprietary institution uh, or a small private nonprofit institution, I think if you have regional accreditation, um, that will typically be something that is viewed favorably if, if there's a valuation discussion occurring. Let's see. What I'm sorry, Emily. I'm running off here. Here's a here's a structural question. No, so I'll, I'll try to stop asking and answering my own question. No worries. Um, no at what, all. You, my wife says all the time. She says if you put me in a room, I'll just have a conversation with myself for hours. So that's, that's probably not healthy. <laughs> what What if ABC School? So thinking about our some of our stru structural charts. What if ABC School is transitioned? and becomes an additional location of XYZ. Okay, so maybe this question was asked right before we did the institutional integration model. Is that considered an asset sale with or without institutional integration? So well, I, I think, think and I, I'm interested, yeah, I think we did. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's important to distinguish that, you know, for, for us, uh, the most, you know, the very most common transaction that we see and it's quite popular um, is the asset sale with the institutional integration, and that that school, you know, becomes a branch campus of the buyer. So is that? I hope that answers the question. Or do you do you think that was the question? Yeah, I think so. No, I think that's exactly the right answer. I mean, it's an asset acquisition okay. um, with an institutional merger. Yeah. Um, let's see. A uh, uh, question here it says: Did Aaron say an equity sale? Is the same as a stock sale. Yeah, I think when we talk about it, when we talk about um, asset versus equity, if you're acquiring stock, we would put that in the equity column. I don't know, Emily, you're the corporate tra transaction attorney. Did I mess that up, or is it, it, it no? That the right place? You were perfect. So okay. equity meaning uh, shares, membership interests. No, yeah, you're good. Perfect. 
that question made me very nervous. I thought I was I thought, well, I've really missed something here. Um, okay, when an integration occurs, when an integration occurs without integration, I'm not sure I understand it. How does one determine who has control over curricular programs? Let's. I think. I think the question is if you have an asset acquisition yeah. without integration. So you would end up with a single operating entity that had two independent institutions within it. How does one determine who has control over curricular programs and operations? And I, I can, I'll take so a I, stab at that. I mean, yeah, I think go you ahead. Do that. Well, I was going to okay. say, I know I think so that's I, your alley. Yeah. So I think, and Emily and I actually talked about this before this presentation, you know, in the, proprietary school context, I have seen it much more common, this structure more common, where again, where a single operating entity, a single legal entity, will go out and acquire two different schools, two different regulated entities, different OPIDs, different accreditors. And those will both be sitting, the assets that comprise those schools will both be sitting within the same legal box, legal entity, I'll call it Operating Inc., and they, they continue to be independent institutions of higher education, right? Independently regulated, licensed, governed. And the reason I think that works on the career school side, uh, and the proprietary school side, is because the way the governance structure, I think accreditors and regulators are more comfortable in the proprietary school context with a more direct governance structure. So you might have a corporate board that essentially is exercising and functioning as the board. So the corporate board of Operating Inc. is functioning and serving as the board of both of those institutions. But I think when you're talking about the private nonprofit side, it is much more complicated, this idea that you might have two independent institutions inside a single operating entity. And I think that it's you know entirely possible that some regulators might have an issue with that or might not approve it. Let's see here. All right, I'm just trolling to the next question. All right. Um, can you discuss the structures where the seller retains assets to serve as an OPM to the sold entity? Oh, this is such a great question, and this this is from um, one of our our uh, a flagship a a, a universe a state public flagship institution. Yeah, I, we can. Uh, let me comment on it briefly, but I will just tell you that was one of the three structures we had at the end of the presentation. And I think it's, you know, extremely interesting. So I'll do my best to sort of describe it here. But what I'll also promise the person who asked this question is, if you will tune in to, we're, we, we will do a subsequent presentation. And if you'll tune into that, we'll talk about this structure specifically. But the idea is here. You would have, if you can sort of visualize and go back to the charts we were showing earlier in the presentation, right? You would have, and I'll say a, a for-profit company, right? And it has within it an institution of higher education. And, and sometimes it is already the case that within that for-profit legal entity, they have separated out certain functions. So a, even though everything is within one corporate legal entity, you've got the assets that comprise the regulated institution of higher education. But then you, you may also have a separate division that is providing services to that institution of higher education, right? Maybe it's doing some, some types of enrollment services or, or student support services, uh, finance or financial aid services, et cetera. And, and even before the transaction, it has been structured such that, that those servicing elements are really being managed by one division within that corporate entity, while the school and its core academic functions and everything we as the public would sort of think of as the school, faculty, staff, classes, curriculum, everything, is sitting inside sort of another division. And then what happens is the, the, that legal entity takes all the stuff those assets that comprise the school and its operations, and they sell those to a nonprofit, either an existing institution of higher education or maybe just a, a, a 501c3 out there that wants to be a school, right? And so after the transaction, 
the school, all the assets that comprise the school that formerly were sitting inside that for-profit legal entity have now been acquired by either a nonprofit institution or that, you know, again, a nonprofit entity. And, and so from the perspective of the regulators, right, the school is now sitting inside of that nonprofit and becomes essentially a nonprofit. But remember we said earlier, there was a division within that for-profit entity that was providing all kinds of legal, all kinds of legal services, all kinds of student support services, et cetera. And those assets weren't sold, right? They, didn't, they weren't really part of the regulated entity. They were always functioning as a different division, and they weren't sold. So after the transaction, now you've got the school has moved over to this nonprofit entity, but after and as a part of the transaction, the, the seller, the for-profit entity says, hey, we'll sell you this school, the assets that comprise the school, for either no cash consideration or a very small dollar amount, some nominal amount. But as part of the consideration for the transaction, we want you, nonprofit, that now after the transaction is going to have and be the school, we want you to enter into a servicing agreement with us. Because remember, we still got all these servicing activities we offer because we're not selling those to you. Those are still part of our for-profit company. And we'll enter into some long-term servicing arrangement, and now we'll provide those services to you. Now, what's interesting is functionally, operationally, very little changes. From the ground, if you're sitting at the school, you know, and you're an instructor or faculty member and you need to call up someone in finance, you're still calling up Joan in finance, just like you always have. But Joan is actually still an employee of the for-profit company that provides the services now. While you are part of the school and your contract has been picked up, right, by the nonprofit entity and the school and everything else that moved over to the nonprofit. So, so when the dust settles, what you've got is the school and all its core academic functions and everything we sort of think of as the school is now in the nonprofit. But you've got all these servicing arms, right, again, maybe finance, maybe def loan default servicing, you know, uh, enrollment support, all that kind of stuff. And it could be more. It could be a platform management, all those kinds of things that are still over there sitting inside the, the for-profit company and being provided to the nonprofit under a servicing contract. And you say, well, why would the – what's in it for the for-profit? Well, so they're getting fees for providing those services. So they sold the school to the nonprofit entity for some nominal amount. But for the next 25 years, they are given exclusive rights to be the service provider to that nonprofit institution of higher education, provide that suite of services – and, and they are getting paid fees, and it is essentially those guaranteed fees for the next 20, 25 years that are a consideration for the transaction. Um, this is extremely complicated. The regulators, and particularly this new administration, are extremely interested in these kinds of transactions. And I think where it gets particularly cumbersome is where not so much really moved over to the nonprofit. So when I gave you that example, I made it sound like everything you would sort of consider to be the school moved over to the nonprofit. But what if, what if we started to really minimize what we considered to be the school? So what if you know, we really just moved over faculty and staff and, and maybe a little bit of real estate? You know, but what if the for-profit entity held on to a lot of the curriculum and the platform and, and licensed intellectual property and all those things so that you really move a pretty small amount? Uh, this bare minimum of what constitutes the regulated entity over to the nonprofit, and all of these wraparound services and important assets stay with the for-profit. The problem the regulators have with that is to say, well, wait a minute. Who are we really regulating here? I mean, we're supposed to be approving the school and regulating the school, and it turns out that a big chunk of what is the school is still sitting over there with that for-profit institution, but now you're telling us that you're a nonprofit, and that's where the rub really comes in. And 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 you know when you start talking about where the rubber hits the road, and where the Department of Ed and some of the others have looked pretty critically at, at some of these proposals, um, it, it starts to really zero in on how much of the school is really moving over. And is it really just the bare minimum core academic functions, or is it really all of the school? And so the service provider is just providing a small suite of services, or are they really providing a huge chunk of what is really the school? Okay. Uh, that was a very long answer, but as you can tell, it's a very interesting topic for me. I think we are nearly out of time. Hopefully I haven't been cut off. Um, 
as always, we appreciate everybody tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful uh, uh, beginning of spring here, and keep an eye out for our next transaction, our next transaction for our next uh, webinar coming up next month. And Emily and Dave, thank you again both for your time today. Bye, all. Thank be you. safe and be well. Bye.